can't tell you how often I will wake up in the morning and get my day rolling, and that part of my day is checking messages and emails and all of that to, you know, catch up on what's going on either with the lives of people in church or whatever, and how often there will be a Facebook message from Ellie, where Ellie has, Pastor Ellie, where he has called, and this is no joke, their church together, and they will gather together in the evening, and they will pray all night. They'll pray all night, and often they'll pray all night for this church in the back of Collington. And here we are in our comfort and our fellowship with air conditioning and the things that we have. And there they are praying for us to be blessed. Um, it, uh, it absolutely humbles me in, in a lot of ways. When uh, um, this Anyway, this is a season where we can be doing the same for them. Amen. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together this morning. And that we join our hearts and we join our faith together. Lord, you said we're two or more gathered in your name touching any one thing we have what we ask. And so we lay hold of health and provision and all of the comfort and peace for Juan Carlos and the 1,100 or more churches there that he oversees and for uh, Eli and um, uh, Buenos Nuevos and, uh, 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 and the churches, all of those places there, Lord, that there would be the comfort and the provision. Um, Lord, that you would move in miraculous and supernatural ways, um, that uh, they would have hope explode in their souls and rise up. As they look out, they won't see devastation, but they'll see opportunity because they know their God is bigger still. And so, Father, we just want to uphold them today. Um, Lord, we pray that they would be encouraged. Lord, we pray that there would just even be surprises today for them, uh, of those divine appointments of people coming to Christ, of food and water arriving, things they didn't expect because you are moving on their behalf. And uh, we love you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of what you're doing somewhere else in the world, not just here. And thank you that they are a part of what's happening here. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you to be watching for that information and to keep praying. If I can get the elders to come, we're going to take up the offering this morning. And as you guys get uh, ready for that, um, um, uh, if we get the ushers to come, there you go, guys. Thanks. Um, as you prepare for the offering this morning, just want to remind you there are a couple different ways you can give here. Uh, this, that mentions there as well as if you're online, um, that information's there. Um, you can give from the website. But what's more important, guys, here is that we, are, we get to give back into the kingdom, and it's not just finances. Last week, we did a lot of talking about being connected to groups, that you get to give yourself into a community, and there's somebody else that's in your circle that needs your story that needs your life, that needs your service, your, your, uh, your words of encouragement, that uh, giving of ourselves is the way this thing works. Amen? And so I just want to encourage you in that. And so let's pray over this offering this morning. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity again to be able to give, to sow into, that as our, we give of our hearts and our faith and our prayers to Cuba and the Dominican today, Lord, we, we give of our, our, our uh, provisions, Lord, into your work that you're doing in the life of this church and in this community. Um, Father, thank you for what you've done out of this place. The generosity of this church is just really always staggering. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. And uh, we just pray you multiply this offering for your kingdom work and bless these folks as they give in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Woo, you guys doing good? Doing all right? All right, man. You know, we've had this hurricane pause, and then the Atlantic's decided to get excited, right? I'll tell you what. Well, I want you to uh, let your faith and prayers be stirred up in this season. You know, one of the things that comes often when there are these difficulties is we tend to get a little more God-focused, right? We tend to be fire alarm people, you know? Um, we don't ever think about the fact that there will be fire alarms in a building or that there would be fire extinguishers. But when the thing goes down and it's all burning up, we're really glad that stuff is there and that we'll pull the fire alarm or grab the extinguisher when a fire is going on, right? But I just want to submit to you that God's called us more to than to being fire alarm Christians. Um, we tend to be more God-focused when things are difficult, but how much more incredible would it be when we're God-focused when things aren't tough? All right. That's awesome this morning. So, um, right, I, listen, dear, if we're thinking, well, God's big enough to move in the middle of my difficulties, well, how much more able is he to do incredible things with you, in you, and through you when things are going well? Just saying, right? 
So I just want to just encourage you. This has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about this morning. I just want to encourage you that uh, um, in this season when there are difficulties uh, around the world and we're more mindful of the need for God to move, that you are no less in need of the move of God when things are going well. And often the greatest uh, uh, challenge for us to grow in our faith is when things are going well. Because we get comfortable and self-reliant. So uh, on your best day, spiritually, I'd encourage you to pull the fire alarm. Not physically. Because that gets you in trouble. There are laws against that. So, but seriously, God consciousness, pursuing his heart, especially in the great moments of life. And uh, all right. Well, you guys doing okay today? All right. I don't know if you're like me. This is one of those days when I'm a little sleepy. Anybody sleepy this morning? Dragging a little bit? I don't know what that is. Kind of, it's funny how it kind of just comes all together. Or so, you know, to get those kind of rainy day drag. It's not rainy out there today. So we can perk up. Well, listen, um, we have been, uh, we have opened up um, this series of messages to kick off our fall. Um, talking about some words that we introduced to you guys uh, in the winter last year. Uh, those words are, are belong, believe, become. There's probably a t-shirt somewhere here today that somebody has with it on it. Um, that uh, for us, we used to say that our process, our discipleship process, the, the thing that we uh, want every believer to go through was to connect to God, to grow in their faith, and then that uh, begins to translate into them serving, to connect, grow, and serve. But as we had this huge thing happen for us last year, starting in July, we were going to be preaching on revival um, that was going to be a series of some teaching we were going to start on the last Sunday in July. Nancy Ballantyne, I think I saw your eyes. Where are you at? There she is. We were in a, uh, a meeting, a staff meeting actually, and she happened to be in that meeting that day. And we were sharing some thoughts and testimonies, and she met, was sharing something about someone, a testimony about someone coming to Liberty and just really feeling at home. And in that line, she said that we ought to have a welcome home sign on the end of the property. And some just stirred in my heart a, a word that I felt like I was supposed to share with the church. And so we decided to push off this teaching on revival a week, and we were going to decide to do this message about home for that coming Sunday instead. And uh, the Lord didn't leave us alone about that home idea until probably the end of October. It was like every week there would be another message that the Lord would give to share, and every week we'd push the series on revival off another week, and we would dig deeper into this idea of home. And uh, that, the, that this is a family, that the church is to be a home, a place for people to come back to and to belong, like we talked about uh, last week. And, uh, and so that was really big for us. Uh, of course, just to throw out there to you, in the process of that series of messages about teaching on home, the Lord spoke to me uh, when I was preparing to share the Dare Challenge revival down in Wanchis because I was like, okay, well, I need to talk about revival because I'm going to go speak at a revival. I mean, they've even got a tent. It's like a tent revival, like old church tent revival. And on my way there, the only thing that was still brewing in my heart was all this home stuff. And the Lord spoke to me and said, home is what revival looks like. He said, you've been preaching on revival since the end of July. That this is, that, that's what it looks like. It's not just some big rock star speaker that comes in, other than the normal boring speaker that you get every Sunday or whatever you may feel about church, and that everybody gets excited about the special music and the whatever for a few, but no. Revival, the coming to life, that's all packaged when people come home. That's the package that, the, that real life happens in your house. True? The memories with your children, the stains on your couch all have a story, right? Right? I mean, uh, and so for me, as I was praying about today, about this idea of believe, I was just so reminded of, of all of that from last year and this journey that we've been on, why we shifted from saying connect, grow, serve, to what we would say is family language, which is belong, believe, and become. It's still the same idea that we want people to make a commitment to community, to make a commitment to God, to give their lives to God through faith in Christ and they become children of God, to know that they belong. And that we want people to believe the right things about God, to believe the right things about themselves because there's some wrong belief out there. And that's all about growing in your faith and for people to become everything that God has created them to be. 
And that comes when you begin to give yourself away. So this has been really, really big for me personally. And the thing that as I was processing through today, thinking about all the home stuff, is that it's been a journey for us since last summer in this process. It's been a journey. So I was reminded a little bit getting in this today of I just had my journey. I shared a little bit about it two weeks ago where we went to California to drop off our daughter for ministry school there. And she's having an amazing time, kind of jealous. And um, she's terrified of heights. On the way to California, we actually stopped at the Grand Canyon for about three hours, went up to the Southern Rim. And so Joseph and Olivia and I, who evidently are the idiots in the family, we're up on the rail leaning over. Of course, Joseph is spitting over the edge. And, uh, you know, because I'm telling him, don't throw a rock over the edge because he wanted to. And we're leaning over the edge, and Victoria and Lisa are like five feet back. Victoria won't even go up to the edge of, of the canyon. Well, yesterday, um, she's part of her schooling there is they are assigned to a small group. They call them revival groups. And uh, part of, uh, they're just starting their year. She's in her second week of classes. And uh, her revival group yesterday went to go do a high ropes course like the one down in Nags Head here. And uh, I was getting these text messages from Victoria. I don't think so. You know, not happening. And, uh, and, uh, and then by the end of the day, it was actually, um, <clears throat> it was actually Friday night because, you know, you get the three-hour time difference. It's, I was up here at the altar at the end, and I get this text message. I've never been so terrified in my life. Well, I wasn't thinking anymore about the ropes course at that point because we were having church. And, uh, and so I'm like, oh, my gosh, what's going on with her? And, uh, and so, I mean, and that's the scary part of getting text messages on your wrist now, right? Because it interrupts what you're doing. And, uh, but then a few minutes later, I got a text message that followed that up that said, but I did it, right? It's a journey from just a few weeks before she wouldn't even go up to the edge of the rim of the Grand Canyon where there was a rail and other people who could hang on to her. Two weeks later, she's up on a high ropes course walking across a little wire about that big, big around 40 feet over the ground, right? It's a journey from one place to the next. And, you know, when we, when we left, to go, obviously our destination was to drop Victoria off in, in Redding. That, in Redding, California, Northern California, that's where we were headed. But honestly, the destination was not the prize for us. The prize was I have never spent so much contained time with my children in their entire lives. Maybe if you added up all the passing moments in the house, you would get the same volume of, of time that we spent together. But we have never had much intentional time together. For an ex We were together 24 hours a day, at least within 25, 30 feet of each other, for 15 days. And as I told you uh, last week or two weeks ago, nobody died. There was no bloodshed. And the only argument on the entire trip happened between Lisa and I. The kids never fussed. It was amazing. I have memories from this trip that I will cherish for the rest of my life. But more important than that, my relationships with my children are different. They're deeper from this journey. Seriously. The conversations I'm having with Victoria now, I've never had that depth of conversation with her prior to this trip we just took. There's a journey. There's a movement. And God has incredible things for you along this journey. I want you to flip over to Philippians chapter 1, if you will. Um, and I don't know how, um, I guess if disjointed is a word, um, I don't know how jointed this is going to be this morning. <laughs> but I want you to follow along with me because the Lord's really stirred some stuff in my heart. I want you to, uh, Philippians chapter 1, we're just going to read this together. And, um, and then we're going to pick a few things out along the way. Prize is in the journey. This is the Apostle Paul. Um, I mentioned, um, uh, I believe it was Friday night, that uh, the book of Philippians I, is one of my favorite books in the New Testament just because of the nature of the book. Uh, Paul, um, Paul is in prison. for uh, He's jailed for the preaching of the gospel. And the entire theme of this letter is joy. So you got a dude that writes about joy while he's locked up. I think that's pretty significant. I think it says something about the difficult seasons of life. What's possible? What's available, right? 
There's something in here that's pretty, pretty incredible for us as believers. And uh, so he is in, he's been in chains for the gospel, and, um, and he's writing this note. And, uh, and, uh, and as he's thinking about the Philippians, he pens these words, looking down at verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you. And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you, or all of you, since I have you in my heart. Whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of, of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. If I was writing a letter from prison, my first words might be, could you please come get me? I don't know that it would be uh, those words right there. He says... He who began the work will carry it on to completion. Um, I want you to do me a favor. If you'll turn uh, to, or at least look at, if you're a little distant, or turn right next to the person next to you, and I'd really like for you to check to see if they're breathing. If anybody has found someone that's not breathing, you could raise your hand and we'll send a member of the prayer team um, to come lay hands and believe. If you're still breathing, God's not done. If you're still breathing, you're on a journey to the spiritual Northern California. You have a rim of a Grand Canyon. You have a high ropes course. You have a nap in your future. I saw a t-shirt recently that I love. It says, it says, Jesus took naps, be like Jesus. I love that shirt. I was going to order it for my wife, but then it's got the little scripture reference where Jesus was taking a nap in the front of the boat. I love that. Um, if you're still breathing, you're on a journey. God's working in you. God has things for you. You're not done. Now, there's something about this that makes me a little sad. Because I see a lot of people living their lives like they're done. And like they've arrived. Or like they're in the process and this is what we do. It's kind of like you get a routine of what you do in your life. This is how I do what I do. I mean, when I come in the house at home, I walk in the door, I put my backpack down. Um, my staff knows here that my backpack is like my security blanket. I take it pretty much everywhere I go. And so when I walk in the house, I put it in the same place when I come. I put my keys in a little green bowl on the white thing. I mean, every time I come in the house. There are some routines that are pretty healthy, right? Because then I know where my keys are. Because if they aren't in the green bowl, I'm in trouble. Because I don't know where else they'd be. But there are some routines that we get into, that we get stuck in. And some people say that a rut is just an open-ended grave, right? Is, what seem, is, a, is a grave with two open ends. Um, if you're still breathing, you're not done. God has more for you. There are a lot of believers who came to the cross of Jesus Christ in all of its gruesome glory and would submit themselves in faith to Jesus and say, I believe in you, and have their sins washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, and they've never found the other side of the cross. They're still there. Did you know that the cross was never meant to be a parking lot? The cross is a doorway into the journey where God is carrying on to completion the work that he began at the cross. There's choices we have to make to be yielded to the work. I mean, have you, try, you got to go somewhere and you try to drag your children out of the house? It's hard to get started. 
<laughs> it's hard to get in the car. We have choices to make sometimes, even though it's not easy, to continue on the journey. Because here's the deal. God's not going to force it on you. And you've heard me say this multiple times from up here. And those of you who've been around here a while, that God's not going to force his work on you. And often we treat God like, God, do something to me. God, make it happen. God, if you'll show me this, then I'll do that. That's not how it works. Jesus just said, come follow me. And then by the very nature of following where Jesus was going, they got to see all the stuff and participate in the stuff that Jesus did. If Peter decided to stay in the boat, he would have missed all of it. Hey, it was good to see Jesus, but he didn't get to participate because he did not yield to the invitation. Now, Jesus did the work, but they needed to follow. That's how this thing works. There's a journey, but we got to go. And what's sad is so many people in their rut of attending church, maybe sometimes, um, Jamie leaned over to me during worship and we're like, you know, maybe, I can't remember exactly what he said, but maybe the hurricanes are taking its toll, you know, because sometimes we get started at 8 o'clock in the morning, there's like four people in here. You know what I mean? For whatever reasons, and there are good reasons why people can't be wherever sometimes, but church becomes a routine. And this never needs to be that. I didn't mean to get into this, but in Matthew 28, Jesus did not say, go into all the world and build churches and gather people on Sundays. As I've told you before, Jesus didn't die on a cross for church attendance. It's always been about people. Jesus gave his life for the children to come home. He said, go into all the world and make disciples, right? And disciples are people. It's about people. 35,000 people in this county, 7 to 10 or so of them are in churches on a given Sunday. There's all kinds of people that God's got a journey for. And he's inviting them into the process and calling them home. That was the whole point of the message last week, was to share with you that every person you see was created to belong. That God's calling them home. That there's a place for them at the table. If you're still breathing, there's a journey to go on. And God, it says here, that he's going to carry it on to completion, that God wants to carry on the work. And all we have to do is yield. It's interesting, he goes on to say here, and this is a side note, he says, I hold you in my heart. He says, as God is my witness, God knows how I long for you in my heart. And I just wonder sometimes about my own self as I listen to Faye share up here about our family in Cuba and our family in the Dominican, how we hold them in our heart. If it becomes information that we just hear passively, I'm like, oh, kind of like when you see the, the SBCA commercials on TV and we change the channel because we can't see the sad looking dogs. Anybody else do that? I can't handle the commercial, right? I like I cry every time. And, uh, you know, and it's like, and they, they pick the absolute worst cases to put them on, you know, TV. And then you go down to the SBCA and the, it's a great looking dog just going, hi, baby, home. You know, he doesn't look as rough as the dog on TV because they're trying to capture your heart. But we have that passing moment of awe and then we move on. Paul's saying here, I hold you in my heart. Again, it's always been about people. In this process here, we're not asking you to commit to a program, or to commit to a building. Now, we believe in what we do around here. But everything, you ask any of the staff or any of the leaders here, the thing that we talk about all the time, that it's the Father's heart for all the children to come home, what we want you to commit to around here is we want you to commit to the Father and everything He has for you and the call on your life, and we want you to be committed to people. And everything that we do around here, we just want to help facilitate you to grow in your knowledge and understanding of the Father who loves you so much and to have the opportunity to be committed to people. Does that make sense? We don't want you to be a fan of the team. We want you to play on the field, right? That's our whole heart here. And church over the years has gotten such a difficult rap at times for being about self-sustaining. I want you to know, I, I hope I believe in my heart that if this place empties out, I'm still going to be around trying to love people. I don't want this to ever be religious rut for you, and I don't ever want this to be just a job for me. I want this to just be about our Father and people so that we can grow deeper in our knowledge of Him 
and to grow in our love for people. That we would hold people in our hearts. Then it's interesting. Then he goes down and he prays this prayer. And I want us to focus on this for our remaining few minutes this morning. He says this. And this is my prayer. Now listen. That's a, we pray about all kinds of things, right? I go up at night, and my kids and I, we pray uh, every night. Um, it's my job to tuck the kids in, and I pray for them. And every night, we pray together about different things, but the prayer always opens with, you know, Jesus, just bless them, uh, give them great sleep tonight, great dreams, and a great day tomorrow, and then we pray whatever we're going to pray, right? You know, God is great, God is good, love us, thank you for our food, right? We know that one. My granddaddy sitting at a table used to say, over the teeth and through the, through the gums, look out, stomach, here it comes. Yay, God, is what my granddaddy used to say. I love that one. Cracks me up. And then he would often end his prayers with amen, and then he would say a woman too. And uh, he used to do that all the time. I love it. Um, that's funny. That's a good memory. It just hit me this morning. Anyway, I, uh, we pray those prayers. But when he says, this is my prayer, what he's saying is, this is the desire of my heart, God. This is the cry of my heart. This is the core of the matter. And this is what he says. That your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight. That your love may abound more and more. So, okay, so we've established now that God is continuing a work. It's carrying on. It's not a parking lot. It's a highway. We're on a journey with experiences and things to grow to. And now what he's praying for is what he knows God wants them to have, which is that their love is going to abound more and more. If you're breathing, not only are you not done yet, there's also more. More of what you've known, more than what you know. It's interesting. He's saying, I want you to grow in knowledge and in discernment or depth of insight. There's more than you know. There are things about God you do not know. I shared with someone on Friday night um, at the service um, that I, uh, uh, when I was a teacher in middle school, um, well, I taught middle school. I wasn't a middle schooler in teaching, but... Um, when I taught middle school, um, being that it was a small Christian school, um, there were just a couple of guys on staff, which means everything that they might want a guy for, we did. didn't matter what my real job was. And uh, so we did everything from move cabinets to plunge toilets to whatever. The guys got called, and we did it. And, uh, and so one of the things that we did is we would always get slotted into being male chaperones on field trips because we were kind of the only two male adults there. And so every year uh, while I was teaching, I would help chaperone the eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C. So on one particular trip, we were, if you've been to D.C., you can stand on the Capitol steps and look a little over two miles. It's like 2.2 miles down the mall, the green grass, um, when they don't have it all torn up, to the Washington Monument at the other end you've ever been there okay and so we were standing on the steps of the capitol and all of the eighth graders uh, not all of them i think it was just the group of guys but anyway they were standing there and they were squishing the washington monument between their fingers you ever done that like you're down at the beach or whatever and you can kind of look down you can even do it in here and kind of like i can get you between my fingers and you know you can and they were doing that to the white it works doesn't it see and uh she's doing it to me she's squishing me um and you look down the mall and at the washington monument they were squishing the washington monument between their fingers well we walked down the steps and we walked the 2.2 miles we stopped and had a had a picnic in the middle and we walked all the way to the washington monument and when we got to the Washington Monument, this was a season when you could actually get all the way up to it. You may be able to now, I'm not, I don't know. But you could go all the way up to the Washington Monument and you could touch it and lean on it. And the guys, one guy named Adam in particular, were leaning against the monument, putting their face against it and putting their arms out like this. And so I was up there leaning against them with it and I was looking up like this and it was amazing. I was like, I can't see the top of it. You ever been you know, so close to it, I couldn't even see the top when I looked up. And the Lord spoke to me and I was an absolute wreck. I mean, just major, Lord, just, you know, you ever had that moment where God just really put something in your mind and you know it's him? And he said, that's the journey. And I was like, okay, I know that's the Lord. What are you talking about? You know, what are you talking about, Willis? What are you talking about, Lord? And he said that when you start out on this journey, you think you've got it all in hand. He said, but the closer that you get to me on the journey, the bigger I get. He says, you get so close, you can't get your arms around it. 
You can't see over it. You really don't understand all of it. It's way bigger than you, but you can touch him. It's the journey that you would grow more and more. And that even there, when I get to the point of the Washington Monument, to touch it and put my arms around it, there are things to know, things to learn, right? Who built it? What do they do? What's that inscription on the top of it? Because there is one, you know, all that stuff. There's, there's more to God than you will ever figure out in all eternity. But it's founded on the fact that you can bank on, that you can know, Paul prays elsewhere in the New Testament, that you would know the height, the width, the depth, the length of God's love. That you know that, you've encountered it, it's the reason you can yield to the journey in full faith and with a lot of excitement trusting Him because you abound in love and then you can grow because of that love more and more in your depth and your insight of Him. The picture here is like a river rising at a flood stage until it spills over its banks and affects the surrounding areas. The word here is agape, which is unconditional love. It's God's love. It's the founding block. It's the key. It's the starting point. So this goes to, it is imperative that we have right belief about God. Because some people really don't trust that God is loving because of their natural experiences. And we want to blame God for this stuff. So we misjudge him. And all of a sudden we have a foundation that's not built on a secure understanding of who God really is in love. So the, what we begin to grow in is wrong insight and wrong discernment because it's not founded on the truth of God's love. So we abound in a different direction. Are you okay? We're all right? Not too heavy yet. All right, we're still breathing? Okay. <laughs> all right. We want everyone to know, um, oh, back up for a second, and then he says this after that. He says uh, that we want you to grow more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And the reason he wants you to grow more and more based on God's love in depth and insight, verse 10, so that you'll be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ Jesus. So what you have is what he wants you to have in the journey, and then this is the goal and the result where he says, to be filled with all, all of it. And if you're not there yet, you don't have all of it yet. There's more. He wants you to be filled with all of the fruit of righteousness. And that comes because of Jesus. So righteousness bears fruit in your life. So if we will yield to the journey because of God's love and we begin to abound in that, which means we know him more, depth of insight, we have right belief about him, we can begin to make better decisions because of righteousness, the right relationship with God that was given to us because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we can begin to bear and have all that comes from it. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, right? That we can the blessings that God wants to pour out in your life, the fruit that it will bear in other relationships, that we'll get to have all of it. Now, we want everyone to know that they were created to belong. We want everyone to know that they can come home. The reason for that is because we want them to come and to be filled with all of the fruit of righteousness. My deepest desire for all of you is to have everything God wants for you. And I know what he's done in my life. I want you to have it. I don't want you to miss a thing. Who was that? Was that, uh, was that uh, Aerosmith that sang that? I don't want you to miss a thing. I don't want you to miss a bit of what God said. Now, my dad, I've heard him say this my whole life. I've heard my dad say this my whole life. Righteousness simply means right relationships. That's what the word righteousness means. It's a, it's a churchy word. It means right relationship. So it goes like this. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ puts us right with our Father. Because you can't get right with God. You get put right with God. So the sacrifice of Christ, we place faith in Him, surrender our lives to Jesus, we get put right with the Father. Now, 
When we get put right with the Father and we begin to have right belief about Him, well, guess what happens? You become rightly related to yourself. You begin to see yourself as He sees you instead of what everybody else tells you you are or what you've told you yourself you are. The judgments of the world and how you've judged yourself. Wrong belief about yourself. So you begin to get right with yourself. And what happens when you're put right with God and you begin to be right with yourself, it empowers you to be rightly related with everyone out here. Right relationships, all the fruit of righteousness. Could you imagine that life that you're called into? Right with God, whole within yourself, and empowered to be able to go out here and live not under fear or condemnation or whatever with all the people you meet, but to be able to hold them in your heart the way that Paul does. You ever believed a lie? Yes, you have. Everybody looking at me like I'm crazy this morning. Yeah, you have. You believe something that was not true. Briefly, I had a very good friend years ago who was a camp director. We were serving at a youth camp. And uh, his story, he, uh, uh, growing up, um, had a difficult time in family. And his father um, was a very comparative person. And so my friend had an uh, older sibling who was the athlete, who was the, uh, you know, the, the dean's list student, straight-A student, all that stuff. And my friend struggled in school. And so his father and his brokenness, the way he would seek to motivate uh, my friend was to tell him, you don't have the sense that God gave a peanut. That was the phrase he used to say to his son all the time. You don't have the sense that God gave a peanut. All the time growing up. So my friend continued to struggle through school. He got terrible grades. Um, He really barely graduated high school. He was uh, not behaving well in some of his choices and all of that by that time. His father pulled some strings um, at a college here in this state and um, because he knew some people on the board and was able to arrange some things to get him into college on a probationary status. And, uh, of course, he's floundering, not doing much, not really going to class because... At this point, he believes he doesn't have the sense that God gave a peanut. And uh, so one day he runs into a professor on campus that he is uh, in a class with, and they're chatting and uh, just catching up. And the professor, I can't really remember, said something to the effect of, you know, what's your major? You know, what are you planning on studying? And my friend says, well, I don't don't really know because I'm not going to be here long. I won't make it in college here. I'm not a good student. I'm not very smart. My dad only pulled strings for me to get in. And so this professor says to him, you know what, I want you to come by my office and I'm going to give you a test. And he said, no, I fail tests. You know, and he goes, no, no, it's not that kind of thing. Just come by my office. He goes over to this professor's office and he takes his test and it was an IQ test and, uh, that he gave him. And so he went on about his business. A few days later, this professor calls him in his dorm room and the professor is sobbing on the phone and can't really talk. And so my friend freaks out thinking, uh, you know, something's wrong. So he goes running across campus, right? No cell phones at this season. So he uh, runs across campus, goes in this professor's office, and the professor is laid over his desk, and he's crying. He's sobbing. And Brian says, what in the world is going on? My friend Brian says to him, and the professor says, we have failed you. And he's like, I know. And, uh, And they were like, no, 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 no. He said, all of your life. All of your life, you've been told that you were a failure and you wouldn't amount to much. He said, you've been failed. We have failed you. Instead of encouraging and sowing into you. And he said, showed him his test. His test, I can't remember the exact number, but it was genius level IQ. And so from that moment, he went on to graduate as the valedictorian of his class. And, um, and became very successful following that in his life. And so in terms of business and stuff... Believing a lie will change your journey. That's why Paul is saying, I hold you in my heart, so I'm praying for you that rooted in love, that you will abound in knowledge and insight. But if you are rooted in a lie, if you have wrong belief, you're going to abound in other stuff. So right belief about God and right belief about yourself is paramount. 
It's important. So we want everybody to know that they don't have to be orphans anymore out there on their own, that they're wanted home, that God's calling all the children home. But as they come home, they need to know what their father's really like and what he sees in them. And what God wants is for them to grow in that because there's always more and it's always good. So over in Luke 15, um, over in Luke 15 is the story of the prodigal son. You guys are familiar with that? We uh, taught a lot on that last fall. Um, I think it's one of the most important, um, important things in the scripture. One, this is Jesus' story. He tells it. It's in red. <laughs> so you know it's Jesus' words. And if you know the story in general in Luke 15, we have a son who asks for his inheritance early, which is basically telling your father, you're dead to me, go ahead and give me my inheritance, right? Because you don't get an inheritance until somebody dies. So he's basically telling his father, you're dead to me, give me my inheritance. So he divides the inheritance between the two boys, goes ahead and gives the son his. He, he leaves home, and he goes off into a far land, and he squanders his inheritance, it says, in women and wild living and whatnot. That's what the scripture talks about. So he just blows it all in a party life. Finds himself destitute and in a pig pen. Which, as Jesus, who is a Jew, speaking to Jews in this moment, that would have been horrifying to them because pigs were seen as unclean in that time. And so he is in the pig pen, eating with pigs and rolling around in, you know, in the mud with pigs. It would have been horrifying to them. Like, there is no lower place. He is at the lowest of low of low places because he is abounding in something else, in his own choices, right? led him to where he is. And then if uh, down in verse uh, uh, 18, he makes this decision that he's going to go home. Now, his motivation for going home is that my life is terrible. I have totally blown it. But at least at home, I know that there's food. At least at home, there's some hope. A lot of people come to Christ that way. My life is terrible. My life is screwed up. I don't know that I understand all this stuff about Jesus and church and all of that, but at least there's some hope. Okay? So he makes this decision. This is what he says. I love Start with verse 17. He says, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your slaves or hired servants. That's what he says. What we have here, listen, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He believed that his father didn't want him anymore because of the choices he made and the condition that he was in. He comes home with that mindset. He leaves home, winds up feeling like an orphan, and then comes back with an orphan mindset. Dad's not going to want me because I've totally hurt him, I've totally blown it, and my life is totally screwed up. And so because of those things that he believes... He sees himself as not worthy, not loved, and wants to come back to his father as a slave. How many Christians, myself at times, get into this thing when we feel like we've got to get it all right so that God won't be angry at us? Performance-based acceptance. If I do good, he's going to be happy with me. If I do bad, he's going to punish me. They're doing bad down wherever, so God sends hurricanes to wipe them out. It's a bunch of hogwash. It's because people don't have right belief about God, and they wind up having wrong belief about themselves, and they're finding themselves in pig pens, or they come home and try to work, 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 and prove to God that I'm good enough, love me. It's a works-based faith. What they don't understand is there's a father in this story that was just waiting for his son to come home. That there was always a place for him. That he runs out on the road and he meets him and he puts his own robe on him and a ring and sandals. He walks him home. Throws a party for him and says, my son is alive. He's home. The son discovers he had wrong beliefs about his daddy. So many see the father like the prodigal son. He'll reject me. He doesn't want me. So many see God as mean or vengeful. But the scripture tells us in John 3.16 that God so loved, 
he gave his only son. Romans 5, 8 says God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, another interpreter, while we were still enemies with God, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 10 um, is where, again, it reiterates that we were God's enemies, but we were reconciled, we were put right with God through Jesus' death. And it goes on to say, how much more will we be saved through his life? I love what I heard uh, Eric Johnson say recently. Christ didn't just die for you. Christ lives for you. He rose for us to have life. He died for our death, but he rode and rose and lived for our life. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing so it's crucial that we learn to believe what God says about himself and about us. To believe right things about God, believe right things about ourselves. If we know that God is good and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, then he is loving, he is kind, and he is for us, then we will approach him wholeheartedly. We will be busting it down the highway on this journey because of everything we know that God is going to reveal and that it's all going to be good and that we can grow. We can do it without fear. That closeness with the Father is what is offered to us. Intimacy with God, who only gives good gifts to his children. The scripture says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. And that what is offered to us really is the deep longing of every heart. If we discover in Christ that we are sons and daughters and heirs to the kingdom, then we become free from the judgments and opinions of the world. We won't be tossed to and fro by everything that comes down the pipe. We become world changers. I want you to flip over to Ephesians 4. If I can get the worship team to come, and we're just going to close up and pray together this morning in just a minute. Um, Ephesians chapter 4. I want to read this to you. Look down, if you will, with me down at verse 11. And it says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay, translation. I'm praying that you will abound in love more and more so that you will have growing depth of insight and discernment. God gives us roles in the body, apostles, prophets, to equip us for what? So that we can grow. That's just what this is saying. And then he goes to equip us for works of service. What is that? You're never more rightly related than you are when you're serving someone. When you're washing their feet. So it's the fruit of right relationships because of Christ. It will be built up until we reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people and their de deceitful scheming. In other words, when we abound, when we grow, when we learn deeper and deeper right belief about God and deeper and deeper right belief about us, we grow in the knowledge of this word. We grow in our knowledge of what God is like, that we grow in our faith, then we are able to stand against the things that say, you don't have the sense that God gave a peanut. You can stand against the things that say you're worthless, or I'm comfortable, because that's a dangerous one when we just get comfortable in our lives. We can stand against those things because we've grown it says this, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become every, in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So I don't want to rope you into programs, but I do want us to be the people that are about people because of what we know about our Father and what we know about ourselves and we know what they can have. Right belief is so important. That's why we have Bible study between services. That's why there are small groups all over the Outer Banks. It's why we offer these things to you. It's why we tell you, be daily in your word to grow in your faith. You were meant to grow. Dead things don't grow. Alive things grow. You were born again to grow. It's important that you abound more and more. Because as we just yield to the journey, we just get in our word and all of a sudden God works the word in us. We just choose to serve somewhere, and all of a sudden, God just birthed something incredible for us because we just showed up and decided to serve. We decide to give, and God just does something in us related to generosity. We find ourselves changing our neighborhood. 
because God did a work in us because we're abounding and we're getting the fruit of all righteousness. We want you to know that you belong, but once you know your home, it's important that you begin to believe the right things. And you do that by participating and yielding to this journey. The word, the small group, serving your neighbors, you grow. Is that okay, gang? So I'm going to pray for you as Catherine comes. And uh, why don't you guys stand with me, if you would. Father, I thank you so much for these guys this morning. Um, and as Catherine shares a, a few things with us as we close, Lord, I just pray that there will be a determination in our heart today. That in these next moments, there will be some lies that will be obliterated in the minds of people and the truth would rise. They were created to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Not orphans, not failures, but sons and daughters. It's not about whether we got the sense of a peanut. It's about you've given us Jesus and we can have all the fruit of righteousness. We can abound. So we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.